She fell like a maple seed, pirouetting on an autumn breeze. A column of light streamed from a hole in the sky world, marking her path where only darkness had been before. It took her a long time to fall, in fear or maybe hope. She clutched a bundle tightly in her hand. Hurtling downward, she saw only dark water below. But in that emptiness, there were many eyes gazing up at the sudden shaft of light. They saw there a small object, a mere dust mote in the beam. As it grew closer, they could see that it was a woman, arms outstretched, long black hair billowing behind as she spiraled toward them. The geese nodded at one another and rose together from the water in a wave of goose music. She felt the beat of their wings as they flew beneath to break her fall. Far from the only home she'd ever known, she caught her breath at the warm embrace of soft feathers as they gently carried her downward. And so it began. Robin Wall Kimmerer, a citizen Potawatomi scientist and writer, recalls her elders emphasizing the importance of ceremony as a means to remember to remember. Just so, we must undertake to remember our place and purpose as humans on Turtle Island. The capital L land, which we inhabit, not merely defined by borders and names on a map, but rather by all that surrounds us and that we possess the capacity to relate to. Put succinctly, without supposing simplicity, the land is everything. In remembering to remember our role in relation to the land, we must look to our many older and wiser siblings who inhabit it. As Tewa author Gregory Kahete reminds us, unlike Western religion and philosophy, however, the fact that humankind had been the final product of the purposeful life force did not make them the crown of creation. Coming last, human beings were the younger brothers of the other life forms, and therefore had to learn everything from these creatures. From this perspective, we understand our purpose as observing and learning from the life around us in order to discern how we may best live. And so the questions we hope to address are, in what ways has dominant American society failed to engage and even recognize its purpose? And understanding that trees are indeed our elder siblings, how might they inform us as role models for how we should live and relate to the greater land around us? Well, the premise of these questions is self-evident according to American Indian traditions. By answering these questions, we hope to demonstrate how the American Indian sense of place and purpose is not merely prescribed for themselves, but for all of those willing to humble themselves in recognition and reverence of the land. Kondirang, a 17th century leader of the Wyandot, who had ample discussions with French colonists at the turn of the century, is recounted as saying, do you seriously imagine that I would be happy to live like one of the inhabitants of Paris? To take two hours every morning just to put on my shirt and makeup, to bow and scrape before every obnoxious galoot I meet on the street who happen to have been born with an inheritance? Do you really imagine I could carry a purse full of coins and not immediately hand them over to the people who are hungry? That I would carry a sword, but not immediately draw it on the first band of thugs I see rounding up the destitute to press them into naval service? Kondirang's earnest pragmatism puts in relief just how deluded French society of that time had become in propping up and appealing to a social hierarchy which alienated them from their own common good. He saw people who shunned the lessons of their older siblings and suffered for it. Tell me, which of the trees uproots their own kind to maintain appearances and set themselves above the rest of the forest? It is the society of the trees, which Kondiranc readily understands, and which is lost on those he critiques. To understand that a tree fosters relationship to its forest, to the land below, and the sky above. All of these relations are necessary, and every tree's presence is an active acknowledgement of all of its relatives. 
Such are our role models. Their lives are a reflection of a long-standing truth that relation is central to the existence of any living being. But when we ignore our elder siblings and supplant their wisdom with our own, we stray from relating as equals to pursue dominance as humans, as individuals. Dominant American society constantly reminds us what we can gain through such means. But understanding Kondiarong's point, an American Indian philosophy at large, allows us to understand what our society has lost, what is missing, what has set the foundation for the injustices and inequalities that Kondiarong witnessed in his day and that we continue to witness in our society today. In his incredible book, Native Science, Tewa author Gregory Cajete states, Western science is committed to increasing human mastery over nature, to go on conquering until everything natural is under absolute human control. In this vision, when we have fusion power, when we farm the oceans, when we can turn weather on and off, and when all things natural can be controlled, everything will be just fine. Western science and technology are viewed as the great panacea and as the ultimate means for human survival." End quote. Gehete takes quite a damning approach to this idea of Western science. But what does that mean? In our case, let's refer to Western culture as dominant culture, and Western science as dominant science, as in the US, this type of objectifying scientific approach is dominant in basically every field. It's the focus on quantity of resources for future use, the focus on exploiting natural resources without considering the future ramifications. A Canadian researcher, Max Leboin, further explains the issue of dominant science in their book, Pollution is Colonialism, by saying, quote, the problem is when it, dominant science, becomes dominant to the point of other ways of knowing, doing, and being are deemed illegitimate or are erased. Of course, using natural resources is not a bad thing, nor is taking them from the earth, but it is the destruction of ecosystems, communities, and a livable future for us and future generations that makes this so detrimental. These resources are finite, and exploiting these resources as much as we do now disallows for a positive relationship with the land in the future. Perhaps we should consider taking what we need when we need it. But why does dominant science exploit the land? In consumerist society, there's a fear that if I don't take it first, someone else will and they'll profit off of it when I could have instead. And although, again, there is nothing wrong with wanting to be financially comfortable, to have earned a profit, to have resources at your disposal, it is, again, this idea of exploitation without regard for future consequences that creates so many issues. If dominant science teaches us that the proper scientific method is to isolate and sterilize pieces of the environment in order to observe, extract, and maximize utilization, then native science offers a more expansive way of knowing our land and selves. Native science emphasizes kinship and humility rather than detachment and arrogance. It recognizes that we, like all parts of the earth, are in relationship with the land and other peoples of the land. Native science encourages careful and detailed observation, but not in isolation. It embraces dreams, lived experience, and resists exclusionary generalizations. It welcomes the experience of individuals and interspecies messages that dominant science rejects. It is a traditional and contemporary framework for understanding ecology and the environment. A key tenet of native science is to learn from our elders. If we respect the trees as one of our elders, what can we observe and learn from them? Watching closely, we can see clearly that a tree is in relationship with all parts of the land. It takes in carbon dioxide from the air, it feeds from the soil of the earth, and it interacts with the other beings in its environment. If we are listening, a native forest of northern Minnesota reveals the teachings of the trees. We can learn about the importance of diversity, flexibility, and perseverance during difficult times. A tree in this native forest demonstrates relationships with other beings of the ecosystem, multiple families of trees and undergrowth growing together, honoring the specific gifts and strengths of each. 
The spruce and other evergreens provide year-round shelter from wind and cold. Deciduous hardwoods like maples and oaks reach for the sun during the summer months, offering nuts, sap, and other foods for the animal siblings, including humans. The elder, taller trees feed and shelter the young trees. The oldest grandmother trees continue to feed and care for the forest even after they have fallen to the ground. There is a wide variety of species in a native forest, which teaches us to honor biodiversity so it can offer protection against disease, pests, and climate change. Each tree is both a part of a system and a whole being in itself. Gregory Cajete shares this quote, Native science embodies the central premises of phenomenology, or the philosophical study of phenomena, by rooting the entire tree of knowledge in the soil of direct physical and perceptual experience of the earth. In other words, to know yourself, you must first know the earth. The geese could not hold the woman above the water for much longer, so they called a council to decide what to do. Resting on their wings, she saw them all gather. Loons, otters, swans, beavers, fish of all kinds. A great turtle floated in their midst and offered his back for her to rest upon. Gratefully, she stepped from the goose wings onto the dome of his shell. The others understood that she needed land for her home and discussed how they might serve her need. The deep divers among them had heard of mud at the bottom of the water and agreed to go find some. Loon dove first, but the distance was too far, and after a long while he surfaced with nothing to show for his efforts. One by one, the other animals offered to help. Otter, beaver, sturgeon, but the depth, the darkness, and the pressures were too great for even the strongest of swimmers. They returned gasping for air with their heads ringing. Some did not return at all. Soon only little muskrat was left, the weakest diver of all. He volunteered to go while the others looked on doubtfully. His small legs flailed as he worked his way downward and he was gone a very long time. They waited and waited and waited for him to return, fearing the worst for their relative, and before long, a stream of bubbles rose with the small, limp body of the muskrat. He had given his life to aid this helpless human, but then the others noticed that his paw was tightly clenched, and when they opened it, there was a small handful of mud. Turtle said, Here, put it on my back, and I will hold it. Sky Woman bent and spread the mud with her hands across the shell of the turtle. Moved by the extraordinary gifts of the animals, she sang in thanksgiving and then began to dance, her feet caressing the earth. The land grew and grew as she danced her thanks, from the dab of mud on turtle's back until the whole earth was made, not by Sky Woman alone but from the alchemy of all the animal's gifts, coupled with her deep gratitude. Together, they formed what we know today as Turtle Island, our home. I would like to start by setting the scene with a personal experience. It is a Saturday approaching 7.30 in the morning. A warm cup of freshly brewed coffee grazes your lips as you sit swinging in a rocking chair next to a large birch tree. The sound of a few birds chirping in the distance and some small waves crashing on the shoreline is like music to your ears. There's not a cloud in the sky and the pine trees are using their abundance of needles to filter the bright sunlight for the animals below. A warming, relaxed, worry-free feeling floods your body and mind as you sit with nature and take in the elements. You have subconsciously disconnected from technological distractions, media, and artificial entertainment and feel a shift of focus to nature and its beauty. This is an experience I have felt time and time again. We humans have a reciprocal relationship with the natural world. It is a relationship based on mutual giving and receiving. American Indian philosophy stresses the reality that human beings coexist on an equal playing field with nature, which is overlooked by dominant society. In the culturally informative book, Native Science, within the chapter, Sense, Perception, and Creative Participation, Cajete highlights, as we experience the world, so we are also experienced by the world. Coexistence with the natural world is a two-way street. 
Trees are the grandfather and elder of nature, looking down to the other forms of life providing information. For example, during autumn, trees shed their leaves signaling to humans to prepare for the winter months ahead. There is a sense of calm and peaceful existence when you surround yourself with the forms of nature that isn't felt when one surrounds themselves with artificial stimulation. Dominant society has embedded in the minds of modern humans that we exist on a separate, more superior playing field than nature. Yet there exists a biological connection and an interconnected, fruitful relationship between humans and trees. Humans and animals alike provide nature with carbon dioxide, and nature returns the favor, releasing oxygen into the atmosphere for us to breathe. Trees are a primary source of knowledge for us, and we have much to learn from them. But how can we achieve this relationship with nature when dominant culture has already changed it so much? Can we even have a relationship with nature when it's actively being destroyed? It's really easy to get bogged down by all the terrible things that are happening. I mean, especially right now. But there's always another side to it. Robin Wall Kimmerer is a part of the citizen Potawatomi Nation, as well as a professor and author of books such as the soulful, journey-like novel, Braiding Sweetgrass. In one part of the book, she describes the story she was once told about two twins, the grandchildren of the Sky Mother. One is the essence of sweetness and life, the other is the essence of unlife and destruction. They didn't really like each other, they didn't really get along, and one day they gambled for the fate of all life on one game. They played by throwing painted peach pits into the air, one side painted white, one side painted black. If they all landed on white, life would remain, but if all of them landed on black, all life would end. During this game, the spirit of life called out to all living things for help, and, quoted, in the final roll, as the peach stones hung for a moment in the air, all the members of creation joined their voices together and gave a mighty shout for life and turned the last pit white. This story helps us understand two things. One, that life is cyclical. Destruction and creation are connected, and when one is present, the other will be there too. Second, we can choose what we want. Even though it lost in the story, destruction will always exist. But we can choose what we want to nurture, and if there are enough voices to flip over even just one seed, there will always be life. And as Kimmerer says, if the people give a mighty shout for life, the peach stone game can have a different ending, for grief can also be comforted by creation. But what would a collective shout for life look like? The struggle to survive, reproduce, and continue the species is inherent to all living things, maples and spruces included. These beings exist within a web of relationships that provide benefits to each, each member of this web, and we need to consciously reintegrate ourselves into this web of relationships as exemplified by the relations between the trees and the ecosystems they inhabit. Again, we look to the words of Kimmerer, who said that each of us comes from people who were once indigenous. We can reclaim our membership in that culture of gratitude that formed our old relationships with the living earth. Gratitude is a powerful antidote to Wendigo psychosis, that is, the philosophy of insatiable greed and abstraction from nature that plagues dominant culture. A deep awareness of the gifts of the earth and of each other is medicine. The practice of gratitude lets us hear the badgering of marketers as the stomach grumblings of a wendigo. It celebrates cultures of regenerative reciprocity where wealth is understood to be having enough to share and riches are counted in mutually beneficial relationships. Besides, it makes us happy. By integrating a philosophy of gratitude, interrelatedness, and reciprocity with each other and with nature, we can fundamentally alter the way we interact with the world. This may sound hippy-dippy, but a philosophy that separates man from nature helped create this mess to begin with. And so we need to change the way we look at the rest of creation in order to change that art. Native philosophy is not primitive, it is not pre-mortal, and is surely not uncivilized. 
Understanding and respecting native science is of the utmost importance in order to heal the modern relationship between humanity and nature. There is currently a transactional relationship that exists between dominant society and nature, a for-profit wasteland of overindulgence. A quote from Kandurang critiques these actions. I have spent six years reflecting on the state of European society, and I still can't think of a single way that they act that is not inhuman. And I genuinely think this can only be the case as long as you stick to your distinctions of mine and thine. I affirm that what you call money is the devil of devils, the tyrant of the French, the source of all evils, the bane of souls and slaughterhouse of the living. To imagine one can live in a country of money and preserve one's souls is like imagining one could preserve one's life at the bottom of a lake. Money is the father of luxury, the viciousness, intrigues, trickery, lies, betrayal, insincerity, and the world's worst behavior. But why does this matter? Take notes from the trees. They exist to provide every limb and organ to their children. Though dominant cultures do not reciprocate this deep of a love, for trees to continue providing for us, we must recognize them for what they are, our ancestors, here to give, protect, and to shade. In order to solve today's most pressing problems, our dominant culture has to evolve and expand in its ways of thinking. It must acknowledge that other philosophies, like native philosophy, exist and have existed successfully for thousands of years. Our call for the people to hear the wisdom of native philosophy doesn't mean that dominant science should be abolished just that the teachings of native philosophies and native science can improve dominant science and perhaps help to address the challenges facing humanity and all of creation. Like the trees, we exist in a web of relationships and it is our responsibility to weave together native science and the strengths of dominant science to cultivate a balance between the two that can guide our relationship with the land. The science of dominant culture has a lot to offer the world. But without addressing their cultural blind spots to the rest of the inhabitants of this world, there will continue to be great harm. So join us in a collective shout for life so that we can turn the tide. Together, we can plant the garden for future generations. Like any good guest, Skywoman had not come empty-handed. The bundle was still clutched in her hand. When she toppled from the hole in the sky world, she had reached out to grab onto the tree of life that grew there. In her grasp were branches, fruit and seeds of all kinds of plants. These she scattered onto the new ground and carefully tended each one until the world turned from brown to green. Sunlight streamed through the hole from the sky world, allowing the seeds to flourish. Wild grasses, flowers, Trees and medicines spread everywhere, and now that the animals too had plenty to eat, many came to live with her on the Turtle Island. <laughs>